Thank you very much, Ahmed, for your um, invitation to be here tonight. I think maybe you are a brave man to meet, uh, for, to invite someone like me to your gathering. And perhaps there are some of you who feel uncomfortable about the fact that I am here speaking tonight. Well, let me say there are some of the people in my church that I feel uncomfortable that I am here speaking to you. So you're in good company. I believe that all truth is God's truth, no matter where it is, no matter where you find it. And it is our purpose in life, surely, to find the truth, because it is the truth that will set us free. It is the truth in this life that gives us understanding and guides us and helps us to, to direct our ways. And it's an extraordinary experience for me to come on a Friday night and see so many people here to talk theology. I've given my whole life studying theology and there comes a time when it is the greatest pleasure in life really to, to study theology and also to watch the fortunes of the Geelong football team. Um, but I know I'm in the wrong territory for AFL. You know, it is, um, it is the most central of all questions that we are talking about tonight. We are really talking about the whole issue of evil and the nature of evil in this world. And particularly for Muslims and for Christians, this poses one of the great existential and philosophical challenges in Western society. Cast your mind back into the 20th century. And what you see in the 20th century is the most ambiguous and difficult question. Because what you see in the 20th century are two contrasting things. On the one hand, you can say that the 20th century is one of the great periods of triumph in the history of mankind in the advance of science and all the other wonderful things that occurred within the 20th century. It is a time of triumph when the intellectual capacities of human being, beings began to take charge of so many of the complex and mysterious processes of life. So you can say what we see in the 20th century are the glimmers of something of the nobility and the glory of the human mind. But you see, there is another side to the 20th century. It was also the most barbaric in human history. Never in the course of recorded history for 100 years have so many people been killed by wars. I tried to add it up some time ago, and I stopped at 100 million people were killed in the great wars and the small wars. And we saw things of, of the most extraordinary mechanistic barbarity in things like the Holocaust, the massacre in Rwanda, what happened in Cambodia, what happened in, uh, in Turkey. We can go around the world and say so what we see is this extraordinarily ambiguous picture. And I think by the end of the 20th century, there was this profound sense of uncertainty about who we are, because what we see within human history is this persistence of evil. And many of the optimistic philosophies that human beings have developed are falling over. And no wonder we are moving into that sort of postmodernist fog where people have almost given up the struggle to, we, to, to develop a coherent philosophical understanding about the meaning of things. And I think, from my own point of view as a Christian, I think the Christian church left, less, uh, let our society down badly by turning away from that question. Why is it that evil persists in the course of human history? Now, the thing is, Muslims and Christians have an answer. We have an answer to that question. And it is an answer that I think the world is crying out to know, and that is 
something of the issue that we are addressing tonight. You see, particularly for, for us Christians, it is perhaps the most difficult of the questions. If we believe that God is good, if we believe that God is all-powerful, if we believe that God created the cosmos ex nihilo, out of nothing, then how do we account for the nature of evil? If evil persists within the cosmos, then how do we still support the concept of God as good and all-powerful? Either God is not powerful and can't do anything about it, or God is not good. And both of those options, of course, are not acceptable to us. And so it is interesting that both Islam and Christianity has a prominent view about the nature of Satan. And on this we agree. There are many things that we do not agree on. But on this we do agree. We agree that Satan is alive and well and like a marauding animal is seeking those within the world whom he can destroy. Satan is prominent in the Bible. He's there right at the beginning and he's there right at the end. Satan, as you know, appears in the Garden of Eden when God creates Adam and Eve and God places Adam and Eve in the paradise where all things are beautiful and Adam and Eve are involved as caretakers of the garden and all things are good. And God says to Adam, all the things that are of beauty and of use to you, you can use within this garden, but there is a tree. There is one tree in the middle of the garden which you cannot eat from. And that was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God said to Adam, if you touch that tree, you will surely die. Now God was not saying to Adam, if you touch that tree, I'll kill you. He's not saying that. He's saying, you as a created being operate within certain limits. If you step beyond those limits and if you take on yourself the responsibility of being the final arbiter of what is good and evil in this world, the burden of that will crush you and kill you. And I believe that human history has shown that to be true. And in, in a sense you can say that the course of the history of the accounts of the Bible through the Old Testament and through the New Testament are about the plan that God has given us to resolve that situation and to answer it. When Jesus begins his ministry, when he's 30 years of age and he steps out of the anonymity of his town in Galilee and he begins to teach and become known to the authorities and begins to worry his family. In fact, at this point, his family, according to our stories, thinks that he has gone mad. And as he is pondering at 30 years of age to step in, take that final step, and begin to assert himself in this ministry, we are told that Jesus went away by himself for 40 days and 40 nights and he fasted and at the end of it he was very hungry and the devil came to tempt him. And there are three temptations that the devil whispers like a snake in his ear. The first temptation is this, he says to Jesus, if you are the son of God, and this is the first time that is uttered anywhere and is uttered in the, in, the, in the mouth of Satan. Like a query. Do you really think that you are? Do you really think that you are the son of God? Well, if you are, turn these stones into bread. This is the first temptation. You say, well, what's so bad about that? Well, you see, Jesus, I believe, is now pondering how he is going to proceed. How is he going to conduct himself in this great mission of his in life? And the first temptation that comes insinuating itself into his mind is the thought, well, I can use my special powers to help myself. 
So my religion is about me. I'll turn these stones into bread. That's what I'll do. I can do that. I can look after myself. And this is the first temptation. The second temptation, the devil takes him on the top of a high mountain and he says, figuratively, no doubt in his mind, he says, all of this belongs to me. Which, of course, is a lie. But then the devil is the father of lies. And he says, if you want to operate in this world, all you need to do is bow down and worship me. And then it'll all be yours. And you see, there again is this temptation. If you want to take the message of truth into the world, it is going to be difficult. You will find opposition. You will find great difficulty. So why don't you do a deal with the world? Let's come to an arrangement. Let's have some sort of accommodation here so we can work together. And a lot of religious leaders of all religions fall prey to that seduction and they think they can do a deal with the devil in this world, but it can't be done. And the final temptation is the devil takes Jesus on the top of the temple and he says to him, throw yourself down because it says that the angels will not allow your foot to hit a stone and that they will bear you up so that you will not hurt yourself. So what is that temptation? I believe it is this. I believe the devil is saying, look, if you're going to take this difficult message of truth into the world, why don't you do something spectacular? Why don't you perform a miracle? Why don't you get all the cameras here? Call up CNN and say to them, watch this. I'm going to throw myself off this temple. Watch me. Watch me. And I'm just going to float down. Look at that. If Jesus did that, the whole world would have come storming to his feet. That has never been seen before. And so these temptations are always there. And the voice of the devil accompanies him along the way. As we know, he accompanies us. So Satan is there. In Christian literature, and I know Satan is there in your literature. You believe that Satan is a zin created before Adam and Eve, but similar to us in that he has the capacity for moral choice. He has free will to choose between good and evil. And when God asks the heavenly hosts to bow down before Adam, not as an act of worship, but as an act of respect, Satan says, I'm not going to do that. I am made out of pure fire without smoke. And he is only made out of clay. And so that tension between God and Satan begins. Now I've looked at the difference. I've, I've looked at the similarities and I've looked at the differences between the way you as Muslims and we as Christians talk about Satan and talk about that complex relationship between Satan and us as human beings and the type of moral responsibility that we have in relation to the evil that is present in this world. And there are differences. There are subtle differences of differences of emphasis between the Christian stories and your teaching about the role of Satan. They are subtle. I find them very difficult to explain. I've read them over and over again and I, I, I know there are differences there. But they are subtle and yet they point to quite a profound difference. And I think the difference maybe can be summed up like this. Some people have said this to me and I, I believe it may be so. The way it ends up is this. I think Christians tend to have a higher sense of human moral responsibility in the formula as to who is responsible. Is it the devil that has overwhelmed people or is it the human beings who have become easily wooed and so on? And I think, and this is a fairly crude statement and maybe this will stimulate some of your questions and I'm not even sure that I've got this perfectly right but I will, I will tell you what I think. I think it is something like this. I think for Christians, 
Also remember, we believe in the doctrine of original sin, and you do not. What I mean by that is we believe that there is a type of group moral responsibility. When Adam sinned, that sin and the guilt of that sin is imputed down the ages through us all. So all of us are born, as it were, with that fatal flaw within us so that none of us are able to live pure. And this is our doctrine of original sin. And I think what it does is produce within Christians a sense of guilt and personal guilt. Whereas I think within Islam it creates a sense of blame. And maybe you can see this. I think often Western Christians have a highly developed sense of personal guilt and it's for this reason perhaps that we have developed a, a, a preoccupation with psychology and counselling to the point that it becomes almost stifling which I don't see so much. I see a more sort of relaxed attitude in Islam to those sort of inner questions. So look, I, might, uh, I will leave that there because I haven't got a lot of time, but it's a provocative thought that I might leave with you and perhaps you can, you can give me your opinions later as to whether you think that I may be right. But, but I also, I want, to, I want to give a word of warning I don't know whether this is true of Islam, but it is certainly true of Christianity. Some Christians think too much about Satan. Just a couple of days ago, as a matter of fact, someone in my parish called me up and said, David, I'm reading this book about spiritual warfare. And my heart sank a little. And I said, tell me about it. And she said, oh, David, it is the most fascinating book. I now understand all these things. Now, at one level, I should be pleased. And at one level, I was pleased. I thought, well, that's very nice if a parishioner calls you up and says they're reading some theological work which is, which is uh, opening their mind to new understandings. I should be pleased. But you see, I know people who think that that is where all the action in this world should be. They say they talk about spiritual warfare as the essential ingredient of the, of, of, of the Christian struggle in this life. Now you see, it's, I don't believe that is the case. I believe that God has placed us in this world with a sense of moral understanding so that we do know deep within our hearts what is right and wrong. I believe also, as I've said before, that there is a type of fatal flaw within us all, so that the things that we want to do, often we do not do, and the things that we wish that we could do, we don't do. And this remains within us as a sort of struggle until the day we die. Now, in Christianity, we say that we have an answer, that Jesus has, has actually addressed that guilt when he died on the cross and took on, he took on the penalty of sin because he was the only perfect being that could live in this world. And thus, he died for us. When Christians say that Jesus died for us, that's what we mean, that he actually took on that sort of guilt. And that is our answer. Your answer, as I understand it, is a more, in a sense, even practical answer. Your answer has to do with the discipline and the trust and faith one has in living right according to the laws and teachings of your faith. But you see, what worries me is when people become too preoccupied with this sort of spiritual warfare. I can give you an example of, of what I mean. Before I came uh, to this parish in, um, in DY, I was the director of an organisation called the National Centre for Christianity and Culture. It was a sort of national body that had membership of all of the major churches, the, the Catholics, the Anglicans, the Uniting Church, the Baptists, the Salvation Army and the, and the Orthodox. 
Archbishop Stylianos of the Orthodox Church was part of this, this, this body. And it was in a sense the last, I think the last attempt on the part of Christianity to set up a national centre within the national capital of Australia on, 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 on the last of this sort of free land around uh, the parliamentary triangle. It was about a seven acre block, a glorious piece of land overlooking Lake Burley Griffin. And it was my job to, uh, uh, to start the ball rolling and to gather money and begin to build a sort of a massive centre there. And while I was there, a group of uh, very earnest women, believers, Christians, came to me and said, we understand that what you're doing is important, David. Now, we would like to come and engage in spiritual warfare to defeat the purposes of Satan in, your, in that place. The other people who were working with me said, they said, oh, no, 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 no. That's a bit excessive. It's a little embarrassing. No. And I said, no, go ahead. They, were, they seemed like nice people and earnest people. And I thought, why not? And they came regularly on Wednesdays and systematically they walk, worked their way around this block. They prayed on all the corners. They prayed on the highest spot. They prayed on the lowest spot. And then on Wednesday afternoons they would come and they would pray and slowly they began to explain to me what they were doing. They said that they, were, they saw themselves in a face-to-face -face battle with Satan. And that was their preoccupation. That's all they talked about. That's where they devoted their energies. And all of this earnest, earnest praying was directed at, at defeating the activities of Satan in that place. And they did what they called spiritual mapping and various other techniques that maybe you have heard about. And one day, I fell to discussing what they were doing with them. And I asked them, not just about their theology in relation to what they were doing, praying against the forces of Satan, I said, but what do you think about the state of politics in Australia? And they said, we're not interested. The real battle is somewhere else. I said, but what is happening to the quality of Australian society? Australia is going through the most extraordinary changes at the moment. Do you have an opinion about that? They said, no, 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 David. No. That is not where the real battle is happening. The real battle is the spiritual warfare. It is a cosmic battle against the great forces of good and evil in heavenly places. I'm afraid to say, in the end, I think that is a cop-out. Our immediate battle is in Australia. Our immediate battle, both as Muslims and as Christians, is to use our beliefs and the qualities and values and principles that motivate our understanding of what is noble, what is good, what is just, what is true, what is loving. We believe things about those things and our society is crying out for people of passion and belief to take those values and those principles into the national debate. And if you become preoccupied with the fight with Satan, then you become no use. Look at what's happening to the degeneration of morality and values and the open and egalitarian quality of Australian society is being torn apart by the Howard government. Look at the politics of fear that have infected the national debate. That should be our concern as people who are believers in God. Look at the xenophobic and racist evil of our immigration policy. Last Monday, I was with, uh, I was with a, young, a couple from the DY Mosque. I went with them into immigration in Lee Street in, the Sydney, in Sydney because I was afraid that they were going to be arrested on the spot. I know these people. They are wonderful people. They have been in Australia for 17 years. Their little boy is born in Australia. They are Indonesians. He overstayed his visa. 
He's got a stack of letters from people saying what a wonderful person is. I have written for him. I took Bronwyn Bishop into writing for him. Doctors, lawyers, his boss, people in the, in, in, in the apartment where he lives, people who work with him, they have written letters saying what a wonderful person he is. And he's being sent back. And I was there with him and I said to the people on the desk, you make me ashamed to be an Australian. This man should be allowed into this country. We should be generous and open. And they were going to arrest him on the spot. He and his wife and his little boy, they were going to take him. They were going to take him out to Villawood. And then they were going to charge him for every night that he and his wife were in Villawood so that if he went back and wanted to come into the country, they were going to hold that as a debt against him. But we managed to win him a couple of extra weeks reprieve so at least he can go home and sell a few things up and get some money to, uh, to, to, uh, to take back with him to Indonesia. You see, this is where we should be fighting the good fight, is in these, these matters. We should be part of the national debate. We should be taking on the warmongering, arrogant, perverse ignorance of a man like George Bush. What a dangerous person he has become. I remember I grew up in the, in the, in, in, uh, after the, um, the Second World War. My father and my uncles who fought in the Second World War had a great, great love of the Americans because it was the Americans that saved Australia in the Battle of the Coral Sea where they came to our defence. But now I see Americans as our enemy. They have become dangerous. And our government, you see, has become uh, callow in its, uh, in its attitude towards America. So you see, I think we people who are believers, we people who have values, we have understandings about what ennobles the human spirit. And a lot of people out there do not. Listen to the quality of modern rock and roll music. You hear a type of uncertainty, a, a, a struggle, a, 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 that sort of postmodernist uncertainty is where within the midst of this world can we find something solid which tells us who we are. We know and we believe that human beings are ennobled not by economic prosperity. We say that the quality of a person is judged by the measure of their compassion and their love. So, as we talk about the role of Satan in the world, let me say this. Let's not lose ourselves in that debate so that we get so caught up in it that we lose the capacity to address this generation in Australia. If we do, and we hide within our own communities, then we are doomed to become superficial in our answers to what is happening. And ultimately, I believe, we will become irrelevant. Now, when I say that to you as Muslims, let me say I am saying it to my own people. I get into trouble when I say this in Christian circles often. There are some who say, yes, we're with you, David. And there are others who say, no, let's hide away. Let's put the walls up. Let's talk only to ourselves. On Sunday, when Sheikh Yusuf and I were speaking at Cromer, I talked about the, the Muslim radio station on FM. Now, there are Christian radio stations around Australia and I say the same thing about them, but let me say your radio station, it is like that. It is closed. It's talking only to itself. It is not taking the opportunity to talk about the great issues and debates that trouble the character of Australian society. If Islam and Christianity are going to take their place 
and shift the course of Australian history in directions that we know to be good, then we've got to step out of that model. We have got to develop within our own midst. We have got to raise up within our own communities people who are confident to take on the debates. Talk about immigration. Talk about justice. Talk about workers' rights. Talk about equity. Talk about how we deal with ourselves as a society so that our society becomes rich and full. And you know, I know I can talk to you with confidence about that because I know a little about Islamic history and there was a time when Islam led the world in medicine, architecture, astronomy, philosophy. Islam was the most elegant of all the great religions at that time and led the world in those things. There was a time when Christianity was like that also. But for some reason, things have degenerated. And so it's all something of a mission of mine to talk both to my own faith in those terms and to talk to others who will listen to me, who I know understand what I am saying. And that is my appeal. Thank you for having me. Bismillah. In alhamdulillah, in alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, who Allah the Jalan Muslimin, who Salat was Salam al Rasulah Kareem, who Allah Alihi was Sabi Ajmain. I said, We la ilaha illallah, wa I said, when Muhammad and Abdu Rasul Mabad was Salam Alaikum. MashaAllah. I guess I want to do some, I used to be in business, I love to do inventory, you know. So let me do some inventory right now. Do we have with us tonight anybody that's not Muslim? Please raise your hand. Any non-Muslim with us tonight? Don't worry, they're not going to put a mark on you. Okay. We got one, two, three, four, five, okay. Do we have any Muslims with us tonight? Please raise your hands. How you guys like being surrounded by all these terrorists? I mean Muslims, sorry. Alhamdulillah, it's great to be here in Australia with my brothers and sisters in faith and my brothers and sisters in humanity. It's really an honor, it's a privilege. And I like the format of this kind of a program. I'm from Texas. I'm one of what they call a redneck good old boy. Yup. And you know, I'm from Bush country. <laughs> I'm going to tell you something. I've been talking in front of people all my life, and I always like to use presidents as a chance to, you know, get people laughing. Talk about President Eisenhower. We used to say, I like Ike, he's all right, boo for Stevenson, he stinks all night, things like that. <laughs> then we had, you know, uh, Kennedy. They made fun of Kennedy a lot before he was assassinated. Then they made fun of Johnson. Johnson's from Texas, you know. And then we had, uh, one by one, you know, we always had a good laugh out of every president we had. And then they got Reagan in there. I said, man, now there's a man that nobody can argue with. They said, why? I said, well, he acts more like a president than any other president. He's a good actor. <laughs> we had Carter. And then we had, of course, we had Bush. And then we got Clinton. It was good for a lot of jokes. Some of them you can't tell. <laughs> but this guy that we got now, you don't have to say anything except his name and everybody laughs. Bush. <laughs> I love it. I tell him, you know, Texas contributed a lot to the United States because we did give a lot of presidents. As I already mentioned, Johnson and Bush won and and we sent him a son of a bush. <laughs> what? 
I don't get it. I don't dare laugh. I won't be able to get back in the country. Anyhow, David, I have some good news, by the way. Yeah, always before, you know, when I go through the security checks and one thing and another to go to the airplane, somehow I always get randomly selected for a special screening. That they told me at American Airlines when I got my ticket this time that I no longer am going to be randomly selected. It's permanent. Every time I go, they're going to do it. But anyhow, our subject tonight, we're talking about what is called in the Arabiya, a shaitan, a'udhu billah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us the story of the shaitan very clearly in his last and his final revelation. When he explains to us the nature of shaitan, the substance of shaitan, and then his position to us, his relationship with us. And then he tells us how to deal with it, what to do, what not to do, and then what will be the results, reward and punishment for those who deal with this subject correctly. First and foremost, I want to mention a few things. What I'm going to be saying is from the Quran, so it'll be Arabiya, and then I'll try my best to give some English translation to it. This is very important. Now, this is now nasiha, or advice for my brothers and sisters in Islam. It's important to use the Arabic from the Quran and then give the meaning. The reason for that is because it shows the authenticity of what you are saying. There is no other religion on earth that still has its original text in the original condition and memorized by every single member of the congregation. We have more than 10 million human beings today who have memorized this book in the Arabic language in its entirety, cover to cover. And 85% of those are not Arabs. And every single of the 1.5 billion Muslims in the world today carries at least a certain portion of the Quran with them all the time in their hearts and in their minds. There's no Muslim except they know Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Alhamdulillahir Rabbil Alameen, etc. Am I right or wrong? 1.5 billion people and they know the original text, they know how it is, and there isn't anything to have an opinion about. We know what it is, Alhamdulillah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Kala fil Quran al Kareem, our God, our Lord, has told us in His book, A'udhu billahi min shaitan al rajim, and even before we read this book, we seek refuge with Allah from the condemned shaitan. Hu Allah, He is the one, Khalaqa samawati wal ard, who created the heavens and the earth, fi sita ayum, in six periods of time, or Yom days. Thumma astawa al al arsh. And then he rose above his throne. He tells us also in his book, Wama khalaknu jinn wal ins illa le yabadun. That he only created the jinn and the human beings for one purpose. The purpose to worship him alone without any partners. The ibadah for Allah alone. I don't really have to say a whole lot tonight because Dr. David Milliken actually covered a lot of ground for me. He basically painted a picture that all I'd like to do is come in and finish off a little things here or there Clean up a little part there, over here. Some of the things he said are right on target, especially when he talked about his own religion, which is Christianity. And what he said when he talked about thinking that maybe Jesus felt like this when Shaitan was talking to him, or maybe he was thinking that, and so and so, I remember those things real well. We all had our own opinions. See, every preacher I knew had something to say about the verses of the Bible. I've even been in churches where I've asked 
the pastor to describe to me what their particular aqidah is or their creed. And they would say to me, we believe this, we believe this, we believe this, the church believes that. And I said, wait a minute, hold that. What, what, what do you mean the church believes? He said, I don't believe that. I said, well, it's your church. You have to believe it. They said, no, we're free to believe what we like. That's true in some denominations. With Islam, it isn't permissible for us to have any opinion whatsoever about the Quran other than what Allah and his messengers said. Those are from the verses of the Quran itself. So it makes it easy for my job because I don't have to sit and philosophize. I can just go and say, well, this is what it says. Alhamdulillah. Next, when Dr. David Milken did speak about the belief about shaitan in Islam, he was really, really close. He was very much on target, as much as some Muslims I've known, but needs to be clarified a little bit. Not saying I'm correcting anybody, but just what we call clarification. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran about other creations beside us. He tells us that he created the malayaka, the, the uh, angels, first. And these malayaka or angels are created from pure light, which explains why you can't see them. Nobody sees light. You can only see what light reflects off of. He tells us that he created the jinn, and the jinn were before us, the jinn were not angels, but rather they were made from a smokeless fire. The difference between the jinn and the angels, though, isn't really their substance, but is something called free choice. I'm not going to use the word free will, because in Islam we say, La hawla wa la illa billah. Allahu ala kulli shayin kadir. There's no might, there's no power except the power of Allah. And Allah is able to do whatever He wills. But we don't have that ability. We can't will anything. If I could, I'd will for a new BMW or a Hummer in the parking lot <laughs> with a full tank of gas. I did pray for rain when I got here, and that worked. And then yesterday, I prayed for it to stop, and that worked. And then I was really kicking myself. Why didn't I say Hummer or BMW? <laughs> Could have stuck that in there. Next time, inshallah. <laughs> but the nature of the jinn was that they could make choices. Allah gave them opportunities and then let them make their own choices. The nature of the human being is similar. Allah tells us in the Quran, This is Surah Atin. That when he created the human being, he created him in the best form, the best mold, the best of the creation. And then he reduced them to the lowest of the low. But who did it really? We did it to ourselves. Did we? Yeah. Allah tells us also in the Quran that there was one. Iblis. From the jinn. By the way, he used to worship Allah. You know that. He used to worship Allah exactly when the sun comes up. When it's first a little ball out there on the horizon. When it's straight overhead and when the sun is sinking down. Just when it makes a ball on the other side. Those three times. And that's the three forbidden times for us, isn't it? Yeah. But when Allah created the best of his creation... Human beings, Adam, actually Adam. He commanded all of creation, bow down, for I have created the best of my creation. And all creation obeyed Allah and bowed down, illa iblis, except for iblis. Because of what? What was the word that Allah used in Quran? Because of his what? His what? Kibr.
his kibber. And what is the problem with kibber? Kibber from the root kabara. There's another word that comes from this same root, akbar. And who is akbar? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahu akbar. Allahu akbar. Allahu akbar. So whenever a person stands up and says, well, I want some, you know, I want some of that for me. It doesn't work. Allah does not accept any partners. No associates. There are no gods beside God. He made Iblis aware of the fact that by disobeying him, that he would be one of the denizens of the hellfire for eternity. What did Iblis say to that? In the Quran, what did he say? What was his response? Do you remember? He said, I don't care. Just let me take him, Adam, and his offspring with me to hell. Did he do that? Was that his idea? And Allah told us in the Quran. I'm in Surah Baqarah right now, chapter 2, verse 208. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا ادخلوا في سلم خفتان ولا تتابعوا خبتوة الشيطان إل إنه لكم عدو مبين O you who believe enter into Islam perfectly do not follow the footsteps of the shaitan verily he is to you a plain and open enemy what were the footsteps of the shaitan? Part of his footsteps was he worshipped Allah. Part of his footsteps were that he was elevated up really high, actually, to the level of angels, although not an angel himself, right? But the footsteps that we're talking about here is when somebody starts getting so proud. Ah, look at me. Do you know who I am? Ah, and this is Kibber. Riyadh leads to kibber, kibber leads to shirk, and shirk leads to the hellfire. And may Allah save us from that. So this is really a good lesson for all of us to be aware of. Of course we know drinking alcohol, taking drugs, illegal sex, killing people, all of these things are horrible. Everybody knows this is wrong. But a lot of times we overlook the fact that we were also commanded not to have this kind of false pride. And when I say we, I'm talking about all. Because this stands for the Jews in the Old Testament, the, the Christians in the New Testament, and the Muslims in the Last Testament. The same exact teaching. Get down off your high horse and walk along with the rest of the people. That's an expression we got down where I come from. And Allah tells us in the Quran, or do... They think they'll enter into Jannah, paradise, without the fitna, the trials, as came to those who passed away before you. They were afflicted with severe poverty and ailments and were so shaken that even the messenger and those who believed along with him said, when will come the help of Allah? Yes, certainly the help of Allah is near. In chapter 29... The very beginning, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Alif Lam Mim, Ahasab and Nas. Do the human beings think they're going to be left alone on saying we believe and they won't be tested? And for sure, Allah is going to test them just as He tested those before to do what? And He said it to show the truthful of those that are true and the liars and their falsehood. So, what is Shaitan to us? He is a test. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us that every one of us. When we're born, there's a kareen, which means an intimate, a close one, attached to you like your juggler vein. That shaitan is a part of your test. That's why when we go through life, there's always somebody there trying to mess up the good things that we're trying to do, isn't it? Somebody always telling you, like even you did a good deed, you want to give some charity, and somebody saying, you know, you show that off a little bit. Let people know what you're doing, right? Any good deed, mess it up for you. And certainly help you with all the bad deeds. 
Who is this devil? Is he real? Or is it a figment of your imagination? Or is it just something in philosophy? According to the Quran, he's very real. Substance is real. You just don't see it. He lived before us. He's still alive today. That's an amazing subject right there, isn't it? That's amazing. Sometimes I hear Muslims tell me, if I just had more knowledge, you know, more knowledge. How many times have you heard that? If we just had more knowledge. I'd like to encourage all of us to have more knowledge because definitely this is something important in Islam. But at the same time, do you think just knowledge by itself is going to save you? Is that going to be your salvation? Because wouldn't you think that the devil has got some knowledge by now? I mean, after all, he was a witness to the creation of Adam himself. True or false? And he knows. I mean, he's been around. I, he's tried to mess up every single prophet. You heard Dr. David Milliken talking about Jesus being tempted by the devil. Right? Even the devil tried to bother Muhammad. And then finally, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made his kareen submit. But even then, the shaitan kept trying to bother him, didn't he? Try to bother all the Muslims. What I said was to just kind of touch up the painting a little bit, put a few things in there, because David did a really nice job. The best job that he did was to come out here and be with us tonight. For you Muslims, you may not realize what that took. You know how you're shy to go somewhere, maybe to another part of the city where there are no Muslims over there. Or you'd definitely be shy to go into a church or something like that. And, and actually, in some cases, we're not supposed to go in other people's places of worship. It's still all the same. How do you think it would feel to come over here and be with us tonight and actually speak and bring what he feels he needs to say? I think he did a good job. I love you. It's really easy for me because when I'm with the Christians, they know I used to be one. I speak the plain old English. When I'm with Muslims, you know, we all get along. I don't really have that, that fear of speaking like that. And having studied both scriptures to some extent, I don't claim to be the expert on anything. What I came to realize is something amazing. That when I studied the Bible and the Quran side by side, an amazing thing occurred to me. The Quran says there are no contradictions anywhere in it. And if you're in doubt about it, bring a book like it. Now, I know the Bible came from God. But ever since I was a little guy, I've heard my dad and other scholars discuss the Bible and contradictions in the text. But they always said these are contradictions in later manuscripts, contradictions in translations, interpolations of various authors who came along later. Nobody ever said God didn't know what he was doing or revealed a messed up book or anything like that. No, no, that that's not the point. But they all admitted that what we have is not the original, but it's got a lot of good stuff in it. What I found here with the Quran side by side with the Bible is an amazing thing. I could clarify the verses of the Bible that I didn't understand before. In fact, I found that the Bible doesn't contradict the Quran except where it contradicts itself. So I don't have any need for trying to debate with anybody about the Bible. Got the Quran. And for those who are in doubt, they're welcome to take a free Quran and get it from our website, download it to their computer, and read it for themselves. Or if they send us a letter, we'll send them a free Quran. I want people to know what the message of Islam really is. 
by the way, my speech ended about 10 minutes ago. I'm just wasting your time. <laughs> In closing, I would just like to give a meaning to some of the words that you and I use every day, but I'm afraid that some of our Christian friends, non-Muslim friends, might not really understand the depth of. The first and foremost is a word called Allah. Why do Muslims say Allah? Why don't they say God like normal people? Well, I got news for those who think that all, all the Christians say God. It's not true. In fact, many, many Christians say the word Dios because there are so many Spanish-speaking Christians in the world. Many of the Christians are Catholics. South America, Central America, and Mexico, for example, they speak Spanish or Portuguese. If you go to Portugal, of course, Spain, Italy, France, what, do, what are they speaking? What are their languages? Do they say God? No. Go to Europe, go to Germany, go to Czechoslovakia, go to some of the other countries. Christians there also don't say God. They have different words for God. Is that true? But every single Muslim on earth uses the word Allah. Do you know that? Every single Muslim on earth, 1.5 billion, all agree. That's what we call Allah. And, by the way, all of the Arab Christians also use the word Allah. And the Arab Jews as well. The word Allah is in the Arabic Old Testament, page 1, 17 times. And the word Allah is in the New Testament, in that verse that they love to quote so much, for God so left the world that he gave his only begotten son. That one says Allah in it. Alif lam lam ha. So for the benefit of those who think that there's something wrong with using Allah, it was used before there was the word God. The word God didn't exist even a thousand years ago, because there was no English until the Normans invaded the Saxons in 1066 AD. What did they call him before that? The word Allah means, let's find out the meaning. It comes from the root Elah. Elah means anything which is worshipped. A rock, a stick, a stone, a bone can be worshipped, right? And you can say Alilah, which means the God, still doesn't bring it to the level of the God as in Allah. In English, you have to see it written down because it's the same word. You have to see the big G or the little G or you didn't know. For the plural in Arabic, gods, aliha, and this is the plural. English, s, just puts after anything in English, you got the plural. Gods, right? But when you say Allah, it cannot be made plural and it cannot have gender. Even though it says he, huwa, in the Arabic, and even though it says we, in the Arabic, nahnu, it's only out of respect and out of royalty, never out of plural and never out of gender. God is not a man, God is not a woman, and he doesn't compare to his creation. Laysa kamithlihi shay'in wa huwa, samiun basir. That he is not like any of his creation, yet he is all-knowing, uh, all hearing and all seeing. Is that right? And he said, Lam yalid, wa lam yulad, wa lam yukuluhu kufu wanahad. He's not the son of anything. He's not the father of anything. He doesn't compare to anything. There's nothing compares to him. And he's a had one. Unique. Not like anything else. Is that right? Amazing, huh? What's really amazing is that I found a similar verse in the Old Testament in the book called Numbers chapter 23, verse 19. God is not a man that he should sin. And God's not the son of man that he should repent. So there we go. We have some things right there that amazingly we're a lot closer maybe than we think. We don't want to leave our subject before we mention the word Islam. What is Islam? Now I know that some of you mean well when people ask you, what's Islam? And you go, peace, Islam is peace. Okay? You mean well, I know you do. But when I walked up here a while ago, what did I say to you? Do you remember? 
I said, Salam alaikum. Did I say that? So that means peace be upon you, right? So if Islam means peace, why didn't I say Islam upon you? Islam alaikum. That doesn't make sense, does it? No, Islam is much bigger than that. Because it means the surrender, submission, obedience, sincerity, and peace with Almighty Allah. It describes our relationship with God. It talks about how we're supposed to be with Him. And who's on top? Allah. And who's the servant? Us. Who's the abd? We are. Servants of Almighty God. Doing what He wants us to do. The prayer that is mentioned in the New Testament, in two of the Gospels, where Jesus is telling his companions how to pray, I looked real close. He didn't say, pray to me, I'm God. He ordered them to pray to the same one he prayed to. He even told them, my God, your God, my Lord, and your Lord. And in that prayer, it clearly says, God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's the best way I can describe Islam in plain English. Do what God wants you to do and stop doing all the things that shaitan wants you to do. Make sense? Yeah. Let's wrap it up and go with what Allah said in the very end of the Quran. Very end. The last two surahs or chapters of the Quran. Where did evil come from? Did you want to know that? <laughs> A lot of people will tell you evil, evil came from the devil. They said it. I heard a lot of people tell me that. It comes from the devil. But if it came from the devil, that means the devil has power. Does the devil have any power? If he does, that means that Allah's got competition. If Allah has competition, then there's a power split out there somewhere, and that means shirk. And we don't believe in that. La sharik Allah. Is that true? La sharik Allah. How many of you made Hajj, by the way? Hajj? You know what I'm talking about? What would you say when you got there? La baik, Allahumma, la baik. La baik Allah, sharika lak la baik. Yes? We're saying, here I am, oh my Lord, here I am. And we're saying there's no partners with Allah. No shirk, right? So according to us, nobody created evil except Allah. Allah created evil. How many think that's a mistake? Is that a mistake? Is that what I just said? Did Allah create evil, yes or no? We're going to take a vote. <laughs> Tell you what, before you go too far, I'll read it for you. A'udhu billahi minash shaitani rajeem bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Kul a'udhu bi rabbil falaq min shari ma khalaq. Say, I seek refuge with the Lord of daybreak from what? From the evil that he created. As a test for you and me. Who created it? Allah. Wow. Wamin shuri ghasakini the waqab. Wamin shuri napatati fil uqad. Wamin shuri hasadini the hasad. Say, I seek refuge with the Lord of daybreak from the evil that he has created, from the evil of the darkening night as it comes with darkness, and from the evil of malignant witchcraft, and from the evil of the envier, hasid, whenever he practices hasidin, he the hasid, when he practices his envy. And by the way, that's a commandment in the Old Testament for the believers in the Bible, it's like the last commandment not to have envy. Same religion. Sent by God to the people before. And then finally, the last surah of the Quran, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitani Rajeem, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Qul A'udhu Bi Rabbin Nas, Malikin Nas, Ilahin Nas, Min Sharil Waswas Al Khan Nas, Allah Di Yuwas Wisufi Sudurin Nas, Minul Jinnati Wan Nas. Say, I seek refuge with the Lord of mankind, the King of mankind, 
the Elah, the God of mankind, and from the evil of the whisperer, whiswas, who whispers evil into the hearts of mankind, who withdraws from whispering after he catches you with it, who whispers in the breasts of mankind from the jinn and mankind. Shaitan is from where? From both jinn and men. So there are devils that we don't see and some devils that we do see every day. And some of them we even voted for. <laughs> Salam alaikum. I, my first question actually is a question I'm, fine, I, I, I'm not sure I can answer. It says, thank you, sir. Well, see, that's very nice to start with. For the talk, please say more about Christians and Muslims' identity. That's a difficult question, isn't it? What does that mean, Christian and Muslim identity? Do you mean how does, how does our faith form our personality and our character. Well, surely that is the case. See, even though I'm here tonight, I'm here because uh, I want to be here and because of this larger sort of cultural issue, which I think for the sake of Australia, it is so important that we lose our fear of each other and that we find the opportunity to talk. But I'm not going to suggest that somehow we're going to produce out of this sort of some sort of amalgamation between Christianity and Islam that, that somehow we, we are sort of entirely caught up with each other and that we, we are really the same thing. We are not. We are not. There are profound differences between Christianity and Islam. Profound. And, um, but beyond that... We are human beings. We are Australians. We have responsibilities, not just to ourselves and our community, but we have responsibilities to, to, to spread the good things and the privileges that we have by virtue of our relationship with God. So, uh, I, look, I really do not know. I, look, I guess my, the short answer to this is, of course, being a Christian will shape your identity. Mind you, let me also say, I think people are at their best and at their worst in religion. When I was the head of religious broadcasting, that was the first thing I said to my staff when I gathered them together. I said, let me say, this is the most wonderful job in Australia to be the head of religious broadcasting, so that all of these programs we made have to do with religions, of all sorts of religions. I said, I believe we are at our best and, our, and, our, and at our worst. So we cannot praise religion enough for the way it has ennobled the human soul over the years, and that is true. At its best, Islam and Christianity and all the other great religions we can point to the way they have produced these most wonderful insights that, that they have sponsored art and philosophy and, uh, and such things. But at their worst, nothing creates more pain and more suffering than religion. Nothing. And you can see it right now. Look at the way Muslims are at each other's throats in Iraq. What could, be, what could be worse? What could be more hideous? What could be a greater parody of religious faith than, than that? So, one's identity is a complex thing and the, the best of one's identity is fostered by the best of faith and so I guess I will leave it to you to decide what are the best forms of your faith and uh, I mean, my job as a, as a minister in the Christian faith is to treat, teach as best I know how and as faithfully I know how the teachings of the scriptures and the, uh, the traditions of our church so that people will learn to live according to the best that Christianity has to offer. Thank you.
just told him I didn't get that one. Bismillah. This one said, why did you leave the salvation of Jesus for a religion like Islam? Hmm. I remember that some years ago I was passing through Houston, Texas. I stopped in a masjid to make Salat al Sha, uh, the night prayer. And while I was getting ready to pray, somebody walked up to me and they said, Oh, it's Yusuf S. is here, blah, blah, blah. They said, Will you give a talk for us after the Salat? And I agreed. They said, but we want you to talk about it. They always, after you agree, that's when they tell you what the subject's going to be, right? <laughs> said, we want you to tell us what most impressed you about Islam. You know, what was it about Islam that really impressed you? Boy, I couldn't think what, where I'm going to go with that. You thought you were stuck. <laughs> so I got up on the minbar after the salam. Bismillah, alhamdulillah. I said, they asked me to talk about what most impressed me about Islam, you know, in the beginning. I have to say absolutely nothing. And the people were looking at me like, whoa, my God, he left Islam. <laughs> I said, no, really, because what I was thinking about Islam is terrorists, hijackers, kidnappers, people that don't believe in God, don't believe in Jesus. They worship a black box in the desert and they kiss the ground five times a day. What do you mean, what, is, what impressed me? <laughs> it wasn't until I saw a real person do Islam that I began to get interested in, what the heck is this, you know? I'm watching this guy five times a day, leaving off his business, leaving off his activities, whatever he's doing, and going and standing over by a tree or in the room somewhere in a corner, and he's standing there and then, no, 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 no. <laughs> and bowing and going through. I said, what is this? This is beautiful. We find this in the Old Testament, book of Genesis, other places talking about the prophets when they used to do like this and take off their shoes and wash and they used to be, had to be pure to go to the, you know, the sanctum sanctorum and they would bow and they would prostrate or fall on their faces. I said, man, let me find out something else about this. And then in his business dealings, when I saw how tough he was on himself about being honest with the people, about representing the product correctly, and actually he would say things against our products, and I'd say, what are you doing? He said, in my religion, I have to be straightforward with my God first. I was amazed. When I looked at Christianity... I was looking for a way to get closer to God. What I had been taught is Jesus is that way. In fact, in the book of John, we find that nobody, nobody can enter paradise unless they confess that Jesus is the Christ. But guess what? I was shocked when I found out Muslims do believe that Jesus is the Christ. Because Christ is from Kone Greek, Christos. Christos is a representation of the word in the Hebrew, Messiah. Which is in Arabic, Messiah. It's the same word. Muslims definitely believe it. It says it in the Quran. The miracle birth is in the Quran. The Immaculate Conception is in the Quran. That Mary is the best of the best of all of the creation of Allah. Is Mary the best woman? And Allah gives her such credit that he doesn't mention any other woman's name. Women are mentioned, but never by name except for her. Plus he gives her a whole entire surah, chapter 19. So it's big credit to her. And Jesus' name is mentioned five, six times, I don't know, more than Muhammad in the Quran. And always with the highest respect, always with the dignity, always calling him what? The son of Mary, the word of God, and the Christ. I said, let me take another look at that. Then I got to thinking about it. The word Christian comes from the word Christ. Paul tells us they were never called Christians until Antioch. What were they called before that? Acts of the Apostles gives us a clue because Paul said, I persecuted the people of the way even unto death. 
And guess what? In English translation, they capitalized the W because it's a proper noun. It was the name of, the, of their, what they did, the people of the way. They were called people of the way. The early people were called the people of the way. How do you say that in Arabic? Deen al-Islam, the way of submission. And nobody can come unto God except through that way. So I didn't see me going into Islam as an act of rejecting Jesus or God or the Bible. I saw it as an act of stepping up to the next level of worshiping the God that Jesus worshiped. Of praying to the Lord that Jesus prayed to. When he himself said, let this cup pass from me, even so though your will be done. I understood that of a subordinate petitioning the one who's in control. So I prayed to that same God. I put my head down on the ground and I said, oh God, guide me. That's the same prayer that I've recommended to every single person I've met since that day 14 years ago in July. And you know what? I've seen thousands of them do that and enter into Islam because all they did was submit to the same God that all the prophets called them to. Simple as that. My question is this. How do you see the future of Muslims and Christians and their relationship following September 11 or the global war on terror? You know, one of the great um, fallacies that emerged after September 11, I remember when that happened, in fact, I was invited along with um, a group of other sort of wise people, I don't know why they asked me, but um, to go on television and talk about this event or um, within the first couple of days. And I said, and, and, and I, I, I remember watching George Bush's explanation for why this has happened. He said, they have done this because we love freedom. <laughs> and I thought, and I thought to myself, if that is the best you can come up with an explanation, then the world is in a lot of trouble. He appears to still believe this. And you see, for him to move from there, to then identify religion and other people uh, to identify this as singularly a religious issue, is to misunderstand the complexities of what is happening. And if you do not understand one's history, then you are doomed to repeat it. And that's, I see, one of the great tragedies of this situation. You can't understand September 11 unless you understand the role of the United States in the Middle East and in foreign policy generally. And then you begin to see the complexities of what, is, uh, what has occurred. And it's a very convenient thing to say, ah, oh, it's because of, it's simply only because of radical Islam. Now, I don't want to excuse radical Islam because radical Islam's got a lot to answer for, even as we speak. The tragedy of people who are using their faith to kill others, you know, is a, is a scandal of the highest order. But... It is not true that religion is the core. I have friends of mine who say, oh, religion has been the source of more suffering and, and more wars than ever. That is simply not true. The First World War was not a religious war. The Second World War was not a religious war. The great, the great killing fields of the 20th century were not stirred by religion. So... We need to take those sort of explanations head on. We need to be able to provide a more complex understanding of what in fact is happening, which means inevitably that we must become political and understand the political process and not hide behind fundamentalist and small and narrow ideas as to what is happening in the world. 
And it means if we are going to show, break down those sort of stereotypes, then I think we need to take gestures that show that we can move across the barriers of our beliefs and reach out to, to each other. I remember the, morning, the Sunday morning of the Bali bombing. You may recall that that occurred very early on, on a Sunday morning. And I was, uh, I was going to church. My church, um, uh, the church that I was preaching at that morning starts at 9 o'clock in the morning. And, I, and just before I took off um, uh, to go to church, I, I happened to listen to a radio broadcast and I heard this news. It's extraordinary news coming out of, out of Indonesia that there'd been this, this awful bombing in Bali. And at that stage, there were very few details. No one knew much of what had happened and no one knew how many people had been killed and so forth. But what, we, what was known was that some, something uh, horrendous had occurred. And I remember standing up in my church and I said, have you heard about what has happened in Bali? And a couple of people said, yes, we've heard. And I said, if that bombing was the work of fundamentalist Muslims, then the Australian Islamic community is in big trouble. And I said, I want us to commit ourselves to go around to the DY Mosque, which is just around the corner for us, and say that we are prepared to make to reach out to them and say that we will stand with them because I know that they will come under attack. And this, this was my first encounter. I went to the mosque the next, uh, the next day. I called up to find out who was, uh, who was the president. The president was uh, Nasser Abdul Gawi, and he has become one of my really closest friends. And Romzi Ali, the secretary, also has become one of my close friends. And we decided then that we would organise a picnic on DY Beach between my parish and the DY Mosque. And I said, I want two conditions on this. I said, we've got to get a lot of people and we have got to get it on the front page of the Manly Daily and show the world that this would, uh, that we can, in the midst of all that, now, let me say, the minute I stood up in my church and said that, all hell broke loose. <laughs> my phone ran hot. I started getting telephone calls. I started people coming up to me and looking desperately worried. So, oh, there's terrorists there, David. <laughs> well, going back into the early 90s, they might have been right, actually, in the DY Mosque, but that's something else. But... I remember one fellow, a lovely man, dear man, he's a very important person in the parish and he called me up and he said, this is the conversation, this is what he said, he said, David, I thank God I do not have a racist bone in my body. He said, I served in the Second World War. I've been to Indonesia many times. I've helped in building projects and he went on and on and on and told me about the things that he had done. And I was waiting and waiting. And then he said, but, David, they are different from us. And I said, uh, Jack, that is sheer racism. <laughs> How are they different? And. And, and, and he became deeply offended and confused and we had this very, very difficult conversation. I said, Jack, I'm coming around to your place now. We've got to talk this through. And so began a whole series of conversation. It was very difficult for me and I know it was very difficult for Nasser and Romsey on the same side. But, but between us, we decided that that's what we would do. And out of that has emerged, let me tell you, the most wonderful friendship friendship with my wife and, 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 and uh, their wives, and we've become really quite close. And, uh, and I, there's nothing I enjoy more than having conversations with Nasser and Romsey about theology. And in fact, I said to Nasser some time ago, I said, Nasser, you are very good for my conscience. You, I said, I've decided you are a holier man than me. And he said, why is that? I said, you are so holy that even when you are fishing, 
your wife sits beside you and reads the Quran. I said, I would never be able to speak and make Margarita read the Bible to me when I was fishing. So. <laughs> Bismillah. Alhamdulillah. You know what? I tried to trade this question off with David a minute ago. He wouldn't trade. <laughs> we were doing real good up till then. But he read it, and that's why he didn't want it. Okay, here we go. Why do Muslims kill people for their beliefs? Yo, baby. Let me read it to you from the Quran and let you be the judge. I'm looking in Surah al Maidah. This is a very important surah. Of course, all of them are important. Dealing with the subjects of what is halal, what is haram, what's permissible, what's forbidden. Dealing with the establishment or reestablishment of the original sharia or the Islamic law, which came from the very beginning. It's the same God. It's the same law, the commandments of Almighty God. And he's just clarifying. And, he, and Allah says in chapter 5, verse 32. And it's, this is right after the story of Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel is mentioned in here, Habil and Kabil, and what they did and how it came about. But now it says, because of what Allah has ordained for the children of Israel, that if anybody killed a person without cause, meaning in other words, not in retaliation or anything like that, or if they did it to spread mischief in the land, it would be as if he killed all of mankind, and if anybody saves a life, it's as if he saved the life of all mankind. And indeed there came to them Allah's messengers with clear proofs, evidences, and signs. Even then, after that, many of them continued to transgress the limits in the land. The recompense for those, I'm in the next verse, the recompense for those who wage war against the law and his messenger and do mischief in the land is only that they shall be killed or crucified or their hands or their feet be cut off on opposite sides or be exiled from the land. That is their disgrace in this world and a great torment is theirs, theirs in the hereafter. But it very clearly is saying why? Because when people are killing other people, you have to stop them. There's a reference for this, one that you didn't give me that one. I, I thank you for not getting any harder. I mean, you did. But there's one you, that has been sent to me after a speech, and I read it, and it said, why does your book say you have to kill all the Jews and Christians? That's what they said. You didn't give me that one, but I will connect it with what we're talking about here. Email and Internet is where you find this over and over. Muslims have to kill all the Jews and Christians. This is a very twisted mind from somebody trying to twist the scripture of Allah's words. It doesn't say that anywhere in the Quran. Nowhere. In fact, it teaches us how to live side by side in a very beautiful way. But yet at the same time to defend ourselves and to defend Islam. What they misquote is the verse in Surah Al-Baqarah, 191. It says, and kill them wherever you find them. And then in parentheses, they say the Jews and Christians. That's what they say. I happen to know a little bit of Arabic. I don't pronounce it very good. I get stuck sometimes. But I'll tell you what. I got a dictionary. It helps me. And it doesn't say that. You have to go to the verse before it. It also starts out with the word and. Both of them start with and, so that means what? You still don't have the whole thought. When anybody walks up to you or you walk in on a conversation and the guy says and, you miss something, yes or no? Okay, so let's go to the verse before that. Yasalunaka, they ask you, O Muhammad, about the new moons. Moons. Say, these are signs to mark fixed periods of time for mankind and for Hajj. Hajj, the pilgrimage. And it is not al-bir, 
that you enter the houses from the back door. But Albir is the one who has taqwa or fear of Allah. Enter your houses through proper doors and fear Allah that you will be successful and fight in the way of Allah those who fight you. But do not transgress the limits. What was that talking about? Because he used the word in Arabic, وَقَاتِلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ الَّذِينَ يُقَاتِلُوا نَكُمْ I'll stop there. What does that mean? The word in Arabic is a, a, a combat. It means to engage in combat and fight even to the death. That's what it's talking about. What is the connection between that and Hajj? Do you know? Because it was when they were going out that this verse comes. And now they've given the permission. Because for 13 years, the Muslims were not allowed to retaliate, even though they were being abused, battered, insulted, and even killed. The women were, I don't want to say, but mutilated. And they did many things to them. And the first martyr in Islam was Sumeya. And she was killed in a horrible way. But they were not allowed to retaliate. You do not have to teach Arabs how to fight. <laughs> Arabs are born with a rock in their hand. <laughs> but what Allah was teaching them was how to be steadfast and persevere and only fight for the right things. Because you see at the time of Muhammad Sallallahu there was an ongoing feud that started over a camel race. The camel race, and then somebody kills the camel out of jealousy. Then somebody kills him, and then they kill that one. And it went on for 40 years of killing and killing and killing. That was the kind of thing that the Arabs in Jahiliyyah used to do. But when they came in Islam, the Prophet ﷺ forbid them, and Allah forbid them. They were not allowed to do any more than just defend themselves in an actual confrontation. He ﷺ was beaten in front of the Kaaba almost to death, along with his best friend and companion, Abu Bakr. That's fact. But the Muslims did not go and retaliate. They didn't go out and say, okay, we're going to sneak out tonight. We're going to get those guys. <laughs> they didn't do that. They waited and waited and waited. And then comes this verse. Those who are killing you. Inna Allah la yuhibbul mu'tadeen. Meaning that you don't transgress the limits because Allah doesn't love those who transgress the limits. It's there still in Arabic as it was at the time of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Nobody's playing with the verses. Nobody from our side, that is. Allah continues, and now we go to the next verse. And it's another form of this word, kati, katilu or kital. Waktuluhum. Now this in Arabic does mean kill, not fight, kill. Waktuluhum. And it says, and kill them wherever you find them. Turn them out from where they turned you out. And nobody puts that in the emails or the websites. I'm going to tell you why. Because then people would say, turn you out from where? Turn, what, what happened? What's the story? They want to know. Because the Muslims were expelled from their own land, from their own homes, from their own families. They were ripped, raped, robbed, and kicked out of their own land and thrown out into the desert to die for over two years. True or false? And then they migrated to Medina. And it wasn't until this verse came that they had the right to go back and claim back their own property and their own possessions. Yes or no? And that was what they did in the very first fight when they did go out and they did fight at the wells of Bedr was to claim back because the caravan was carrying their property in it. They were going to go sell it. Yes or no? Okay. 
So that's what it says. And then Allah is clear again, though. He said, turn them out from where they turn you out. And the fitna is worse than the killing. Meaning what? And fitna is not just an average word. When people are aggressive, abusive, and killing other people, sneaking up behind them and killing them, blowing them up, tearing down their buildings, when they do it in America, they call them what? Terrorists. Thank you. And when Mr. Bush stands on the White House lawn and declares his war against terrorism, everybody said, yeah, all right. But when a law tells you in here the very same thing for the same reason, then they said, oh, boy, that's a book of, you know, uh-huh. Because it continues, and Allah says, and don't fight them, don't kill them, don't engage in this combat at the Masjid al-Haram, the holy sanctuary, unless they first fight you there. But if they kill you, then you kill them, such as the payback for disbelievers. But if they cease, then Allah is all forgiving, most merciful. Fight them until there is no more terrorism. And worshiping of others along with Allah and every kind of worship is Available for people to worship God without partners. But if they cease, again Allah says, let there be no transgression except al Valimun. And let me close this one off by mentioning something important. When the Muslims were ordered, not permitted, ordered to go fight, these people who had committed these acts of terrorism, there were strong verses here and in other places, or Tawbah and others, and hadiths from Muhammad Sallallahu making it clear, if they stop, you have to stop. If they back off, you have to back off. And you don't go into their land and take it over, kick them out, and do what they did to you. You just claim back what was yours. Everybody following my point? Huh? And when you take captives in Islam, you treat them with respect, honor, dignity, and you feed them the food that you eat. You give them the same shelter that you have, and you only have them there to do one thing, and that's to show them what Islam really is so they can worship their Lord alone without partners. And if they accept, they're your brothers in Islam, and you totally forgive them. But if they don't, you still let them keep their clothes on. It's actually me that's causing the evening to finish at this stage because I've, um, I, I, I need to be in the city around about 11 o'clock. Um, so, look, I've got two questions. I'll try and answer them quickly. One is, in the Quran, it states that Mary wore a headscarf. All Christian nuns, whether they are Arab, Arab Greek, Australian, etc., cover. Why is it that Christians are against women covering, wearing a headscarf? I'm not against women wearing headscarves. I have no problem. I mean, I, that is, that, to me, that is a matter of, uh, from my point of view, that is a matter of, of, of fundamental insignificance in terms of a matter of difference. You know, I think, and I defend the right of people to, uh, to express their beliefs in their personal dress and so forth in any way they wish. And I think it's, a, it's typical of the French that they, uh, their xenophobic um, attitudes cause them to, to, uh, to stand against that. I would be very angry if I was a Muslim in France and I would do my best to, uh, to, to change that. I don't think there is a problem and uh, we should be tolerant and uh, I think uh, I would go to your defence if should there be ever in Australia a suggestion that that was not permitted. Um, the, this other question is a very interesting one, and I, 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 and, I, and I really, it's a question that I still struggle with, actually, and I would love this to be the subject of an entire discussion for one evening. And it is, there came a point, let me say, in my discussions with uh, my friends at uh, DY, NASA and Romsey, and I said, uh, this is when we were getting to know each other, you know, and we were circling around each other and, and trying to sort of, uh, uh, see how we would uh, establish a friendship. And there came a day in, um, uh, when I said to them, now look, I need you to answer a question. And I think it is a question that all Australians need to hear from you. And if you cannot answer, 
I'm not sure how our friendship is going to progress. And the question is this. I understand that one of the fundamental differences between Islam and Christianity is that Islam sees its fundamental expression in terms of the establishment of a human society committed to the principles of God's law, Sharia law. I said, if you are going to be a good Muslim, if you are going to follow your faith with integrity so that you can go to bed at night saying that I am following as best I can all the principles that, 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 that will promote my, my true belief as a Muslim, C can I live in Australia without struggling to change Australia so that it conforms to Sharia law? Can you live in a pluralist democratic society? Now, I think that maybe that will divide you right here. Some will say, yes, I can. And some of you, some of you may say, no, I cannot. Well, it can be. See, well but there we go. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, what I wanted, I, I, I got all sorts of answers. I, I, I answered, uh, uh, please, can I, can I please give my answer? And then... Um, I asked that same question to other people, at uh, other uh, um, uh, uh, Muslim friends of mine, and I got a whole series of answers. I got people saying, oh, you don't understand Sharia, Sharia is this. I wasn't interested in those answers. They seemed, they were just those easy answers about saying, you don't understand what Sharia really is. The question is this, is it possible, I wanted to hear a theological answer. Was there something within the history of Islam? Was there something in the Quran which allowed that possibility? And it was Romsey in the end who said yes. And he quoted me at certain instances in the history of the, uh, of the Prophet. And certain times he says, there are occasions, there, there are, and he set down a series of arguments. So I began to go, I, I, I began to rest easy and I felt okay. You will no longer, I, I, I can now become your friend, I can now commit myself to you. And I don't have to fear that somewhere down the track you will become my enemy and you will wish to, to change the character of this society and conform it to, uh, to those principles. And you see at that stage we would now be at loggerheads. So that was a major turning point for me. I needed to hear that and I needed to believe that that was a possible option and that it was part of the sort of is Islamic experience within Australia. And I think on that basis, then it is possible that we can live together at peace. Not only can we live together at peace, but we can enrich each other. I don't want you to change. I don't want, I, uh, in the sense, I'm not trying to, to evangelise you. I am trying to work out a way that in Australia, this country will be enriched by the fact that we can live together. I don't want a single monochromatic society. One of the wonderful things about Australia is that we are able to create this multicultural society. And if ever, you see, we, this present government doesn't like multiculturalism. It's got this small, cold, steely-hearted commitment to economic prosperity, and it fears diversity. When, when Bush says they, they, they hate us because we love freedom, Bush doesn't love freedom, he fears freedom. Look the way he's responding. All of his responses are closing down freedom, freedom of discussion, freedom of political action. We're not as bad as those, but, but Howard and the Howard government is influenced by that and that same creeping fear motivates a lot of our society. Now, we are the ones. They won't learn that lesson unless we teach it to them and we show them how it is that these two communities can live together and enrich each other and enrich the society around us. Thank you very much. I have enjoyed this night very much indeed. Thank you. You know... Alhamdulillah, Allah di jalan muslimin. It just feels good, you know why? 
Somebody asked me one time, I got some questions here, but they're not pertinent to our topic about the shaitan, so. <laughs> Somebody asked me when I was over in Egypt, they said, could you tell us what it's like, what it feels like to go from some other religion to Islam? What does it feel like? I said, they don't ever think about that. It's always thinking theological arguments, philosophies, dogma, but feeling? Well, let me think about it. Next day, I was sitting right by the Nahar Neel, which means the Nile River. I was watching it flow by. It's beautiful, man. I said, I can answer your question. They said, what question? I said, the one you asked me last night, what is it like, what's the experience to go from some other religion to come into Islam? I said, I can tell you if you give me one word in Arabic. They said, what's the word? I said, the thing on the back of the boat, those boats going by, there's a thing. What do you call it? They said, Duffa. Duffa. This is the rudder of the boat. I said, okay, now I can tell you. I said, imagine yourself in the boat and you're blindfolded on a dark night. You can't see anything and you have no Duffa. You feel the boat move, but you don't know why. Was it the water, the wind? What was it? And what's the direction you're going? And how can you change it? What can you do about it? And then one day somebody takes that blindfold off and you can see and you have a duffa. That's the difference. Because being a Muslim doesn't guarantee salvation. It really doesn't. The person was asking about salvation a while ago. Islam doesn't promise us just because I said I'm a Muslim that I'm going to Jannah. It doesn't say that. But at least I know what the right way is. I can see. I'm not blind anymore. I'm not deaf. And I have control over my own little boat. Still have choices to make. But it's a whole lot easier when you can see where you're going. And I really feel that that's the big difference. Because before, before I came into Islam, I didn't understand this concept of who is the real shaitan. And what's his purpose and what's my purpose. Because as a Muslim, I do understand that this life is only a test. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنْ وَالْإِنْسِ لِلْيَابَدُونَ وَقَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَامُ أَدْدُنْيَ سِجْنُ مُؤْمِنْ وَجَنَّةُ الْكَافِرِ Allah tells us that He only created us to worship Him alone. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa tells us that this material existence is like a prison to a real believer, but it's the only paradise for a disbeliever. So we know as Muslims that we're here only as a test. This is not the real Jannah that's waiting for those who believe and do the deeds of righteousness. And Allah says in the Quran, A'udhu Billahi Minish Shaitani Rajeem, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Wal Asr, Innal Insan Alafi Khusr, Illa Ladina Amanu, Amilu Salahatti Wa Tawasaw Bil Haq. But the wasso is sabr. All of you know that one. But for the benefit of our guests, it says more or less in English that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God Almighty, is swearing by the passage of time that his creation of human beings are destined for the hell, except for a few. And he said, except for those who come to the right belief and recognizing the monotheism, the oneness of la ilaha illallah, none to worship except God. No partners with God. And they do deeds of righteousness. So it's belief, it's faith, and it is action both. And these two together, when they're for Allah, that's what it's about. But it doesn't stop there. What tawassaw bil And you have to encourage and exhort each other to the haqq la ilaha illallah and whatever it entails. And, of course, to call the people to al maruf and forbid the munkar. And... To call each other and join upon each other to be steadfast, to be straightforward, to be persevering, and to be patient. 
And may Allah give us that patience, ameen. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us from that devil, ameen. And may Allah put us as far away from the devil as east is from west, ameen. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all his jannah, ameen. And alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Huwa ladhi jalana muslim.